Limited. Today we are here with Dave West, the CEO and product owner at Scrum.org. It's our pleasure to welcome you. Dave, take it away. Thanks, Amy. Hello, everybody, and welcome to today's uh, webinar. Um, I love the fact we put the PMI, PDUs, and IIBA CDUs at the end, so that you have to listen to me to get to that slide, which is which is awesome. I'm actually presenting from um, sort of a cloudy, uh, a cloudy Washington, D.C. today. Uh, I'm with a, a partner, and uh, we're doing some work, but I stepped out because I really wanted to share with you the truth about job titles and some of the myths around around job titles. So um, what worries me greatly in, uh, you know, as we look at uh, Scrum being adopted across the world is that a lot of organizations have a lot of misunderstandings around the role of Scrum. So hopefully today I'll uh, be able to dispel some of those myths, be able to hopefully put a few things right as the product owner and uh, CEO of Scrum.org, the home of Scrum. Now, as you can tell from my ridiculous accent, I am English, though I've lived in America now almost 20 years, I still have that uh, English accent that I was born with. So I apologize if, uh, for the people on the line that uh, if I use any Cockney rhyming slang or other English isms, and uh, feel free to uh, chat in the chat box and ask what I mean by apples and pears. That actually means stairs, in, in case you're interesting, uh, interested in, in Cockney rhyming slang. Uh, I'm the product owner and Scrum Master uh, and CEO of Scrum.org. Uh, actually, interestingly, not the Scrum Master. That's an important separation of, of control. Um, in my job, I get the opportunity to go around the world talking to organizations about the use of Scrum and the use of agility in their, in their org. So hopefully I'll just share some of those insights as we work, work through the slides. Um, so the title of the, of the presentation, The Truth About Job Titles, or Perhaps really what it should have been called is, why is there no tester, project manager, business analyst, or my job title in Scrum? And uh, the amount of times that I go into an organization and I'm told over and over again, well, Scrum's great, but obviously I'm a tester. So um, as a tester, uh, where do I live in Scrum? Or Scrum's great, yeah, we get it, but um, we, we have a Scrum project manager as well, right? I mean, you've got to have a project manager, right? Or Scrum's great, but is the product owner just the business analyst, just retitled? And so hopefully I'll be able to dispel some of those questions or those, those confusions as we go through the slides as we go. So uh, even though I work for Scrum.org, the home of Scrum, our mission isn't, isn't about Scrum. And this is actually a very important point. I just want to emphasize this. If you take one thing away, maybe, uh, maybe this is the thing you should take away. Ultimately, it's about improving the profession. Now, we believe that Scrum is fundamental for doing that. We believe the, the principles of Scrum, the empiricism, self-organization, and this continuous focus on, on improvement is you know, incredibly important for being a more professional deliverer of products to customers that add value. But, but ultimately, if Scrum is not necessarily the best way of doing it, then we wouldn't mind. What we care about is the profession of software delivery. And, and Ken Schwaber, the creator of Scrum.org uh, and the creator, a creator of Scrum, says over and over again, how are you improving the profession, Dave? He asked that question of me. And what's interesting is he tends to focus on two things. He focuses on delivering more value to customers, meaning customers are happy and getting more stuff, and that the teams are happy, that your job, you're happy going into the office every morning. So. That's what I try to do every day. That's what gets me up, and that's the reason why I'm here talking to you today. Scrum is obviously being used a lot around the world. Um, I uh, don't know how many people are doing it. IDC says between 12 and 15 million. You know, you talk to other organizations like Forrester, where I was an analyst and, and uh, ran the AppDev practice for a while. Uh, it was probably about 70% of all uh, software development teams are doing it, but Scrum's being used by a lot of organizations that aren't just building software now. You know, Edu Scrum in the Netherlands, for instance, or in, or in, um, or in Africa, where it's being used to organize a police force in a particular country. So Scrum's being used 
in a lot of different places. And what's great is that as a homeless school, we get to see that. You know, we, you know, we get to see people taking open assessments, over 2 million people taking that. We see the professional scrum certifications at level ones, where there's about 180,000 now doing it. And every day, people are being taught by our team, our organization of professional scrum trainers in many different places around the world. You know, maybe our claim to fame is that one day we saw people taking tests in Alaska uh, and in uh, Argentina uh, and, uh, and also in Africa and India and China. In one day we saw people all around the world obviously caring about Scrum and, and taking those tests. I was surprised that somebody in Alaska would be, uh, would be taking, a, would be taking a, a Scrum test, but I guess they build products and have complex problems there. So, it's interesting. Let's take us all back to the start of everything. Let's take us back to that initial sort of where Scrum came from. The first time Scrum was called Scrum was in this very important paper called the New New Product Game. I recommend that you go to HBR and download it today. It's a great paper. And a lot of the ideas that it highlights, even though it's written in 1986, a lot of the ideas that it highlights are still incredibly relevant today. And also, interestingly, incredibly hard to implement today. You know, the, what, what, the, what this paper talks about is it talks about how um, innovation was being developed by organizations. And uh, these two gentlemen from Harvard went, they were the guys that were heavily involved in, the, in lean manufacturing and the Toyota way, went and interviewed a lot of organizations that were doing innovative work, 3M, for instance, Honda being another one. And they found these, these uh, six characteristics. But the, the thing that I want to concentrate on today is really the first characteristic, which is really talking about self-organization on autonomous cross-functional teams. At the heart of delivery, delivering innovation, at the heart of delivering in the face of complexity, and ultimately innovation is all about managing complexity. Um, if, if it wasn't complex, somebody else would have already done it. So ultimately, is about this idea of self-organization and cross-functional. So when Scrum was developed, it was actually developed out of necessity, out of desire. Ken and, um, uh, Ken and Jeff were working together in, uh, in Lexington, just outside Lexington, it's called Burlington in, in Boston, in the Boston area. They were working on a medical device and they said, well, this must be a better way. They were using sort of an iterative, waterfall-y kind of process and they were having challenges with it. And so Jeff and Ken both went to different places to research why. Now, Ken brought back empiricism. Ken, um, Jeff brought back self-organization and a continuous sort of lean self-improvement kind of model. They blended those together into a model which became Scrum. At the heart of this, though, is this self-organization concept. At the heart of good, agile teams is self-organizing. And the reason is, is simple. The reason is simple because you don't know what the problem is until you actually see the problem. So if you have a very prescriptive, plan-driven approach with very defined, very structured roles and responsibilities, it's almost impossible then to deal with ambiguity or the unknown. So as you reach into this world, it becomes incredibly difficult. So at the heart of Scrum is this idea of self-organization. Now, that led us really into thinking about how you solve complex problems. How can specialist jobs work in the idea of a complex world? Now you see this, this is the uh, Kinefin process for our friends in Wales. Um, uh, what Kinefin provides us with is a way of thinking about problems. Now obviously this is a, a relatively simplistic framework in terms of the problems that you face. You know that every problem that you face has elements of complicated, elements of, um, um, elements of simple elements of chaotic, elements of complex. But if you think about the majority of the stuff that you're working on, it tends to be complex. And that you probe, sense, and respond. The process that you actually support, the practices tend to emerge from the context that you're working in, the problem that you're trying to solve. Now that means that if you've got specialists that are sitting there with particular job roles and responsibilities, then it's incredibly difficult for them to respond to this complex world. So ultimately, when we, when we were developing, when Ken and Jeff were developing 
Scrum, they wanted to make it as simple as possible to allow to support that, that model. And really, they wanted to build an organization that allowed rapid inspection and adaption. So it required some level of flexibility to support the customers, ultimately the thing you're developing, and to support your, the people that are providing you the money, whether it be an organization or whether it's the external VCs, whoever it is, to actually make the right choices with that money. So they wanted to provide an environment that allows flexibility. So, you know, this is the classic inspection and adaption model to support. You identify an opportunity and you have some sort of plan around what you're trying to achieve. You then say, how am I going to do that as a team? You then build a little bit of it. You then deliver it. You measure it. You then go, oh, what did I learn? And from that, you then obviously build out your improved learning and you cycle this over and over again. The more complex the problem, the smaller chunks that you work with, the smaller chunks that you drive. And obviously, Scrum is at the heart of it, provides that framework. It provides the framework to actually do that inspection and adaption. Now, interesting, the life cycle, a lot of people think about this life cycle and use this diagram to explain it as a way of talking about delivering, but it isn't. It's about actually planning. This is a planning cycle. You know, that you sprint planning. The sprint is a unit of, uh, of learning, as it were. And at the end, the sprint review is you get the right stakeholders in the room to review that. Now, obviously, Scrum has only three roles. And we're going to talk more about those roles and talk about the challenges around those roles in, in a moment. But at the heart of it is this planning cycle. You know, that we, we plan these small chunks of work. We meet on a daily basis to observe how we're doing. The reason why it's called a daily scrum and not, interestingly, a daily stand-up is because of that. You know, that, that you're actually, the scrum in rugby happens when forward progress stops, usually because of an infringement or somebody's died on the ball or collapsed or you've lost or somebody has to be carried off on a stretcher. And uh, having played rugby a lot when I was a kid, you know, you know we uh, sort of got used to that. But so the daily scrum is literally that, the ball being the work that you're working on, the outcomes that you seek. You meet daily to talk about it and to reorganize. So it's very hard because you don't know what happened yesterday. It's very hard to determine exactly how you're going to respond to it today. You talk about it. Maybe one of your team members says, hey, I discovered this. And then you go, oh, well, can, can I help? Oh, yeah, sure, I'll come and, you, you know, we need to work on this together. Let's, let's maybe pair up, do some pairing, and work on this problem together. That's the daily scrum. The sprint review obviously looks at the increment and says, what have we delivered? What have we done? Let's learn from it so that we can improve the next sprint. Scrum's really, really simple, but unfortunately, it's incredibly hard to implement. And to some extent, it's because of the way in which organizations are structured to support Scrum. So who's on a Scrum team are, are great questions to ask. What, what skills do we need? The Scrum Guide, you know, it's 19 pages, very simple document to learn, just says all the people necessary to deliver done, to get work out, to get that learning. So sometimes that means that your Scrum team is going to have to have just an arbitrary group of people necessary, the minimum that you get, and then you'll literally have to just inspect and adapt and learn as you go. There's actually three roles in Scrum, product owner, development team member, and Scrum master. I've added a fourth role, which I'll talk about in a minute, but if we just concentrate on those three roles of product owner, development team, and Scrum master, the reason why we have those three roles. Now, you might say in the original new new product game, um, there was only self-organizing teams, right? There wasn't any particular roles. You could describe that as a development team. The reason why Scrum has identified two other roles is because they're really, really important. The product owner ultimately is a decision maker. Now, in most organizations, this is the first time that we actually have a problem with Scrum, usually. You know, basically the decision maker, the person that's actually going to make decisions about about the work that's being done. Now, most organizations usually have groups of people that make these decisions. But ultimately, it's very hard to, be, to rapidly deliver learning if, at the end of the day, you have to sort of get a committee involved to make a decision about doing something. 
Now, remember, you have your sprint review where you can invite a committee of people, a large group of people, to see if the product owner and the team are doing the right things and to provide feedback so it gets into the next, into the next sprint. But the product owner is the first role, the very important role. Development team, this is the cross-functional team of people who have all the necessary skills to deliver a valuable product to their customers. The third role is interesting, Scrum Master. You know, the Scrum Master is the, is in, in the Scrum Guide, it just says the person that ensures that Scrum happens, you know, that makes sure that Scrum is done well. Now, what's kind of cool about that is that you're like, well, is that just about Scrum? Well, ultimately, if Scrum is about delivering value, if Scrum is about delivering, reducing waste, if Scrum is about being more agile, then that's actually a pretty big role, right? Now, it's very important that the master and the product owner are not the same human being. The tension between the, the, the discipline, the tension between running the process using the discipline of the practices and the process and the desire to deliver valuable learning and valuable outcomes to customers, ultimately product owner is the value officer in the team. That tension is good. It's also, you know, very important that the product owner and the development team are separate. Again, because the development team is all about delivering value, uh, delivering, doing the work, the product owner is all about defining the value. So that tension is actually engineered to create the things that we're interested in. Now, there's a fourth role that isn't actually in the Scrum Guide, but is written about frequently in every implementation of Scrum. We call Agile Leaders. That Agile Leaders are all about creating the environment necessary for Scrum and for Agile to happen. And that's many different types of leaders. Let's do a little deep dive on the roles now. Oh, press the wrong button. Oh, there we go. Product owner. I just this in a moment ago. Now I'm the product owner. My job is to maximize the value that Scrum.org delivers on the mission. Uh, my job is to make sure that we prioritize the things that are important for Scrum.org. Now sometimes, you know, I've got some very invested stakeholders. You can imagine that Ken Schwaber is a very, very invested stakeholder in where we go. What's interesting is that ultimately he allows me, he's empowered me to make the decisions. But those sprint reviews can be a little bit scary. I'm not going to lie to you. Um, one human being responsible for managing the product backlog. Well, actually, that's a misleading, that's a bit of a typo. Managing the order and prioritizing the backlog. You know, basically refining the backlog with the team, deciding the priority. Managing sounds like somebody that just spends all their time in JIRA, or, you know, which isn't necessarily the job, actually. Um, in fact, you often empower the team to help manage that backlog particularly on a large or complex product, it becomes almost insanable for one person. But the product owner makes the decisions about the priority and the order of things. Must be able to make those decisions. And no one else can tell the development team what to do. This is very, very important. And often a very interesting challenge in most organizations. Because most organizations say, hang on a minute. No, the product owner, that they just make the decisions on what the business priority. But we've got project managers and departmental managers and heads of this and heads of that that these people have dotted line or hard line into inside the development team. They need to be able to tell them what to do. Well, no. In fact, that's a really important concept. That was added to Scrum. And the reason why the original definition of product owner was actually agile product manager, and that changed. Jeff and Ken changed it. The reason why they changed it was because that was getting in the way of them delivering learning. At the end of every, every sprint, they would find that the team wouldn't deliver. And when they, when they retrospect that and see why, they would find that many of the people on the team were being pulled off to do other things as asked by their boss, which is really, really worrying. So the product owner ultimately is that person who's empowered to make decisions about the product, but also can tell the team what to do in terms of the work, not how to do it. That's very, very important, not how to do it. Because how to do it ultimately is the team's decision. The scrum master, the other sort of different kind of important role, promotes and supports the use of scrum, focuses on transparency. This is actually very important and something that I learned recently on a, at a class that I attended around scrum masters. I'm no scrum master, not my sort of DNA. I like to tell people what to do. I like to tell people 
um, what the vision is. I like to get people excited. That's what I do. I don't like to help make sure that work flows. I don't like to ensure that empiricism is happening. I don't like to ensure that self-organization is happening. I don't like to ensure that improvement's happening. I just care about the end goal and getting stuff out to you guys to improve the profession. Right. Now, it's very important, though, that transparency is a key thing that a Scrum Master provides. Now, the Scrum Master uses transparency to drive empiricism, to drive self-organization, and to drive improvement by making things visible, by making them very tangible, you get that level of, of, um, of agility that is very hard to achieve. To do that, though, they serve us, obviously, as a servant leader. They promote a sense of community. They try to ensure that there's a holistic view of work. They try to get the team to make decisions about not what they're doing, you know, the why, the what, that's the product owner, but how they're going to do it, the, how they're going to execute on it. And so one of the most important things that a servant leader will do is work with the product owner to refine the backlog in terms of, or encourage the product owner to refine the backlog so it's in terms of outcomes. Because self-organization instantly collapses if the product owner says, I want you to update RP150 with these fields. Well, well then, that's a problem, you're going to do that. Whoever does RP150 will pick it up and do it, and job's done. Anyway, so it's important that the, they serve the product owner. They serve the team by helping them understand the value of being transparent, to understand the value of, of the ceremonies, uh, the, you know, the, sorry, the events of Scrum, um, the, such as the daily, to understand the value of, 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 of getting a good done increment, so the definition of done and things like that. And then they serve the organization by pre sometimes protecting the team. Team dog is often a phrase, guard dog, but also, more importantly, driving the value. And this is very much taken from the Toyota model, um, because the idea that as a manager in Toyota, I had responsibilities to the team, to the business, and also to the organization, sharing the culture, the behaviors, the stories around, around uh, good practice in the organization. The third role, really, is around the development team. Self-organization, the pure developing value. Now, development is a really interesting word, and much argument has been made about it. Because, whoa, hang on a minute, I'm a business analyst. I'm not a developer. I'm a tester. I'm not a developer. Yes, you are. Well, Ken would argue that you are, because you're developing solutions. Don't worry, you have some skills. They happen to be business analysis and testing. But ultimately, you will do what it takes to deliver a workout. When we look at the new new product game and we look at actually most of the great examples in our industry from like from Amazon, Google, incredible software, these organizations that are doing fabulous things, what you see over and over again is that though people come with skills, and they do, they're very good at certain things, what you see over and over again is that ultimately they'll do whatever it takes. So that means if they have to organize, um, you know, maybe a developer is organizing the sprint review, you know, the, the event, maybe because, you know, somebody is not able to do it, or maybe there's a, a tester is helping uh, the business analyst go through and build, build out some very interesting requirements because they need to do it. The BA is going in and mob programming because they need to do it. Uh, it's very important that it's cross-functional, necessary to deliver the work, yes, but ultimately flexible enough to allow them to respond to the environment. The reason why Scrum recognizes no titles other than development team member, the reason why we don't is because we want to encourage, that every, uh, encourage the idea that everybody mucks in, to use an English expression, to deliver value to a customer. Titles constrain you and make you less agile. And I'll talk about that more in a minute. And then leadership, this sort of like fourth forgotten role, which is really about building an environment to allow your self-organizing teams, your scrum masters, and your product owners to be successful. And that's very much what we're seeing increasingly around managing impediments, removing roadblocks, running air coverage. All of these things are necessary. Now, you could argue that, oh, is this going to always be necessary? I don't know. 
some would argue that Scrum Master that isn't necessarily going to be always necessary as organizations become more agile from the bottom up. I don't know. But today, it very much is. And so we see the need for that kind of role. So what about you? I know it's taken me like 25 minutes, and I'm not actually talking about you yet. I may have mentioned you in passing, but what about you? I'm a project manager. Does that mean, in fact, I'm, I'm an agile project manager, which is even better. Uh, how do, wh where do I fit? I'm a business analyst. Where do I fit? I'm a tester. I love that tester icon, by the way, don't you? Um, I always think of testers as those crazy um, alchemists sit around finding problems with your stuff. You know, where, where do I fit? How do I fit into this organization? I'm a front-end web developer. I'm a this. But let's just test as business analysts and project managers. Where do, where do, where do I fit? I keep trying to move the uh, thing up. You know, because ultimately, this is true, right? Scrum does not care about job titles. In fact, I even said it earlier. Scrum does not care about job titles. Not true. That is not true. That's a myth. And uh, let me just say why. The reason why we care is one of the most important things to have all the right skills to deliver what value means. Now, hopefully, the job titles that you have today are an indicator of the skills that you're going to bring to the team. You know, business analysts are really important to our teams, particularly when there's really pesky, complex requirements that need all sorts of better understanding, that, that you know, can use techniques to explore it, whether it be story mapping, empathy mapping, all of that kind of stuff. Um, very, very important role inside a team. You know, do we explicitly say that in terms of your job title in the team? No, you're part of the team. We don't measure you as a business analyst. We measure the team as the value that you deliver. But you're crucial to that. We need testers. Oh, my God. Do we need testers? Every time I, I, every time I use a piece of software, <laughs> I realize that we need testers. Um, I might not invite them to my house parties, but we need testers. You know, they, these people are the first person that's, you know, they're like, I was going to make a joke about my mother-in-law, but I, I've been told that I use my mother-in-law too much in presentations and I need to back off in case one day she listens to a presentation. Um, but uh, so I'm, I'm not allowed to say testers are like mother-in-laws when they come and look around your house and say, oh, dear, Dave, so you, you haven't got around to doing the garden yet. Uh, you know, that kind of person. No, I'm not, but I don't use that joke anymore, so I'm not going to. You know, project managers. Well, that's interesting. Do we need project managers? Well, that's an interesting question. I'll talk a little bit more about that in a minute, but we need the skills that project managers have. Now, do, do they do they live on the, on the Scrum team? That's an interesting question. They ultimately, sometimes you will. You'll need somebody on that Scrum team that maybe can work with other organizations, that can manage some of the compliance documentation, that so they can add value. Um, they can add value. The uh, you know maybe they become a scrum master. Maybe they maybe their skills lend themselves very nicely towards being a scrum master. Um, maybe um, maybe they uh, maybe they're more in the product area. We'll talk a little bit more about that. Ultimately, what I'm trying to emphasize over and over again is that you need skills to deliver value. Those skills aren't completely new sets of skills in a Scrum world. It's a myth. Now, Scrum doesn't recognize particular job titles more because we don't know what skills you're going to need, because we don't know every problem. What we care about isn't you being measured as a business analyst, as a tester, even as a project manager. We care about the outcomes that the team deliver, the learning. But we know that skills are important, obviously. And we know that it's incredibly hard to hire somebody when you say, I want somebody to do stuff. I think you're going to get all sorts of very peculiar people. So it's sometimes important to use job titles to help guide that. But ultimately, what you're looking at is trying to get the right skills to deliver value. And of course, we all know that for most organizations, Scrum is already ha is happening inside an existing organization, and it's almost impossible to change. Now, that's a by the way, ladies and gentlemen, it's a real choice 
but, but ultimately, we know that you've got very complex HR, job titles, promotion paths, et cetera. I don't want those things to disappear. I don't want you to feel like you haven't got a future because that won't help you deliver value because you aren't going to feel safe and you aren't going to feel, you know, protected. So ultimately, you'd still need to be able to, to be able to do that, to feel safe and to feel value, to deliver value. So I'm getting a thing, apparently I'm faint because I've, uh, I got super excited when talking about this. Okay, so uh, hopefully you can hear me a little bit better now. Um, these are always challenging, We're in a, you know, um, a little bit better maybe. Anyway, but hopefully you got the, the, uh, the, the information out of that. So Scrum, Scrum does care about roles and job titles. So here's the rub though. Ultimately, here's the rub. Um, okay. Here's, so here's the rub. The rub is ultimately that you need to have an agile workforce. You need to deliver, you know, stuff in that way. You have a series of job titles that might be holding you back. But you want to deliver in, in that agile way and you have a market that wants you to deliver in that agile way. And so here's, here's the rub. You have to somehow build the things in place, put the things in place to allow job titles and the like not to, to get in the way of that. And in fact, that was really described by um, this lady uh, that really talked about that traditional rigidly defined jobs are giving way to more agile project-based work. The workforce is also evolving to become more dynamic and skills led rather than being defined by hierarchy, being defined by that. The future will be much better if we can solve, if, if we can build organizations that are focused on solving unstructured problems and synthesizing new information and using social. So actually it's not just about skills, but how they work with others that becomes very important. So ultimately, the things we're looking for is a different way of thinking about it. So here's some very simple things to help you manage the rub. It's a very simple set of things to help you manage the rub. One of the most interesting things that, we're, that we have seen or, or spent time with is this separation of talent, skill, and job management. It's very hard to deliver transparency in an organization if, at the end of the day, the person you're trying to be transparent with is the person that's going to pay your bonus on your skills and on your contribution. So no concept of team contribution, no concept of outcome, very much focused. I mean, obviously, they're both influenced, but very much focused on your own contribution. Imagine that situation when they, they say, oh, how are you doing? We've all seen that Dilbert sketch over and over again. The Dilbert sketch basically says, Oh, we're doing fine. And then the, you know, the pointy headed manager goes and like, how's it, how's it really doing? Oh, it's a crock of crap. It's all going horribly wrong. Oh, so separating work management from talent, skill, job management is fundamentally one of the most important things that organizations can do. Now, obviously the most famous example of that is with Spotify, but increasingly we're seeing more organizations pick up on that and start using that. The other thing that's important is I don't mind what they're called, but these four sort of archetypal roles become incredibly Im important. You know, that you, you, and you can call them whatever you want. You know, obviously Spotify had their own definitions of these roles. I, I don't really mind. But somebody that facilitates and enables transparency and flow to happen in your organization, we, we would call that a scrum map. Uh, somebody that delivers stuff, we would call that a team member. Somebody that is all about the value that you're trying to deliver, we would call that a product owner. And we would, and then the last one is leader of, and we'll, we'll talk a little bit more about leadership in a second. But ultimately, the idea that you've got some sort of leader kind of role, a person who's there responsible for delivering value in your organization. Uh, as you get an environment for Agile to succeed in your organization. 
Now, your names may change. It doesn't matter what they're called, but ultimately, you still you need these archetypal roles in your organization. Then the second, the third thing is really in you need to put in place a community that allows that development of it. So, so think about this. Imagine I'm a team member working on a team, and I'm a business analyst. Uh, I do great work and use the latest ideas around business analysis. So where am I going to go? Am I going to become a scrum master? Well, maybe. Am I going to become a product owner? Well, maybe. But maybe also I want to be good at being a business analyst. Maybe I want to invest in that and become, you know, developed in that. Maybe I need to start leading the community and helping other business analysts become really good. You know, one of the greatest skills of business analysts is to be able to facilitate information, right, to ask the right question. Asking the right questions is at the heart of, of, of good business analysis. Now, that's a skill you can learn. I met some business analysts that get it and can teach it. So imagine the idea that you become a leader in that business analysis community. Maybe you're still a team member. Maybe you step out of the teams and just become a member, uh, a mentor, and you teach a lot of people to fish, as it were. The same is true of maybe a front-end Java developer or maybe somebody that's more focused on, on back-end databases, security, user experience. The idea is we start building professional communities of the skills, and we group those skills in some logical way, the skills necessary to really deliver value to our customers. We start building a formal organization around those communities to help help that work. And that means that you get promoted and you have a career path that's about your skills. Or you can be a scrum master. Oh, hang on a minute, there's probably a community around that. Or a product owner, there's probably a community around that. So what you end up creating is an environment that's very much built around your actual skills to be a team member. And it's less about job titles and more about this interactive community kind of idea. And remember, ultimately those skills are transferable into any context. Scrum doesn't mean that you, you know, those skills don't matter. In fact, they really, really do matter. And they're really, really important. Self-organized teams, in a nutshell, need to manifest these characteristics. They need to be motivated, you know, autonomy, mastery, purpose. Those, you know, the, the interesting thing is that autonomy means they need to be allowed to be who they need to be to deliver value. Mastery, as individuals inside those teams, they need to be part of a community that allows them to become more masters of their craft. So if I'm a developer, a business analyst, a tester, um, even a project manager, to some extent, those skills that a project manager has rather than the title, you need to master those crafts. And then you need to have a purpose. Now, hopefully a pr good product owner is going to drive that, that purpose. So that also means if it's going to be a self-organizing team, you have an opt-in kind of model around teams. You allow them to organize how they want, and you allow them to work out not for what they're doing. Remember, that's guided by business goals and the product owner. But ultimately, that self-direction is necessitated to deliver the how. So that means that we need to break away from this command model. There are a lot of job roles and hierarchy around jobs and job families have created. We all know that boss trumps transparency that it's hard to balance the needs of today with the needs of the future. The bottom line is you're on so many meetings, on so many projects, on so many things, that you don't have a chance to invest in learning some new skills or spend the time helping other people get good at those skills. What's interesting is as we move into the 21st century, and as we move into this sort of like more knowledge-based economy, as we move into the age of, you know, the age of acceleration, the age of software, um, what we see over and over again is that the way that those organizations build out their skills is really around, isn't around formal career structures and the like, but it's more about mentorship and coaching and helping others get better. And that, you know, I've just recently reread The Fifth Discipline by Senge, is about creating a learning culture within an organization. 
imagine that you're, everybody is responsible for developing their own skills and developing their own things that they need, balancing the needs of today and the projects and the products that they're on today with the needs of tomorrow as defined by the community. Imagine that the community has time to, to do that. Now, you know, that means we're going to have to move away from this model, you know, that ultimately the only way to get promoted in most organizations is, unfortunately, to be a manager and to manage others and then manage, manage others. I don't know if this resonates with you, but the idea that that is your focus, you get promoted to your own level of incompetence, I think my grandmother used to say. We need to move away from that. And instead, focus on skills, delivering value, community, helping others. How many people have you mentored today? How many people have you, are you coaching today? And focusing on the skills necessary for, the, for today's problems rather than the past hierarchical organization. It's not about the system anymore. It's about the values and the outcomes that we deliver. So, you know, what journey are you on? Are you on, you know, the product journey, the technical journey, the scrum master type journey? What journey are you taking today? Now, hopefully, you know, if it's a technical journey, that could definitely be uh, a business analyst journey, a tester journey, uh, a developer journey, a UX journey. It could be it could be working with third parties and contracting. It could be managing, you know, those external dependencies. But it's not, the journey isn't about managing the system anymore. It's not about manage, knowing that you have to fill in a form 764659. It's not that kind of journey, hopefully. Because ultimately, I don't think the end game that we're looking for, if it enables that, needs that. The other thing that, what, what, that's very clear that we've seen over and over again is that that today we're seeing us move more into the need for a different kind of profile for people. The job titles never really helped. I remember when I was uh, first out of university that um, um, I started work for a large insurance company. And this was, uh, oh my God, this was 91, nine, no, no, 92, I guess, 92, 93. I'm not that old. Phew, that was a worry for a second. Anyway, I started work for this uh, insurance company in, in de the development role. And uh, I can remember there was this uh, business problem. And this guy said, uh, oh, let's go and see Roger. I was like, Roger? Who's Roger? He's some like fabulous actuary or whatever. Oh, no, no, he's a, he's a developer. But he knows this system better than anybody. And he understands the actuarial processes. And let's see Roger. His job description was COBOL developer, level three. But he had a lot of other skills. Sometimes job titles miss a lot of this. I think increasingly we're going to be moving to a, to a world that very much talks about cross-functional skills, that very much talks about you know being a specialist in multiple areas as well as having that broad knowledge. There's going to be no excuse to not having that broad customer-centric knowledge. The business that you're in, you might be a Java developer, but if you work in insurance, you need to understand your customer and the aspect of the customer that you're responsible for. If you're a Java developer, you might be a UX developer, you might do some testing as well. So maybe you're looking more like that, that comb-shaped person. But over time, you're going to be broadening those skills and adding, adding those technical skills, which might mean you're in multiple technical community. It's going to be an interesting future that we move to, where instead of focusing on job titles, we focus on, on, on really skills. And we focus on community. You know, I hopefully I've made it, you know, very apparent over the, over this last 45 minutes and highlighted the fact that, you know, we're looking very much at building technical communities and getting promoted for your contribution in those communities by helping people develop, by getting, making people more successful, ultimately you build out the skills necessary to become more valuable to your organization. I can remember a particular organization I was working with where we had a developer that was really, really good, like, like the best developer. And I've worked with some amazing software engineers, fortunately, in my life. And this guy was the best. 
Um, I, and I looked at the GitHub commits and I realized that 80% of them were hit. That was really, really worrying because it was so an active cyclist and I was worried he was going to get knocked down by, by, a, by a, uh, a bus or something on, on his ride to work. So being very selfish and caring about the business deeply, I decided that I needed him to help others get better. Now, initially, nothing really happened. He said he was working with others, but, you know, they're not quite smart enough, and he's always very annoyed by the working with them. So I had to resort to very aggressive techniques. So I switched off his GitHub privileges. And he, and he was like, whoa, 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 whoa. I said, the only way you're going to contribute is by helping other people. That's how I'm, that's why I'm going to pay you more money and promote you and you're going to become more important to me. is isn't because of your individual contribution. It's because of your contribution for others. Teach lots more people to fish. Teaching is the most important skill that a leader has. And after a bit of time, I had to give it back for a bit, actually, that's another story. I, uh, he became a key member of the enablement of the organization. Communities are really important for our modern world. To support agile teams, to support scrum teams, you need them communities to work around them. And obviously the most famous community oriented model is the Spotify model. You know, this idea of squad, tribes, chapters and guilds. Now this is unique to Spotify. Interestingly, when squads are really scrum teams, <laughs> tribes are a collection of, of squads that work in a related area, chapter is a family. Inside, of, you know, so you end up with this idea that like skills work together and learn from each other and support each other, and a guild being a cross community of practice across tribes. This idea that people can help each other in an, in an effective way. This is uh, probably one of the most famous examples of, uh, of a community model working. This is unique to Spotify, they it themselves, it's unique to their way of working, but I think we can learn a lot from it, even if we decide to use different words and even if our model is slightly different. It also means, though, two interesting things that we're seeing over and over again, which is this alignment to product. So, you know, at an organizational level, all of the stuff we've talked about, so we've talked about, you know, the importance of decoupling responsibility, uh, you know, this idea of skills, decoupling work management from skill management, this idea of community practice. But really, it tends to, for the organization, it tends to break down into two things. Number one is alignment to product. You know, that we end up with teams that are very much focused on delivering value to customers. I don't care about business analysts. I'm a business analyst working for this customer, for this customer outcome. I'm maniacal about this. I'm a developer focused on this. This is that cross thing in the T-shape or comb shape. Um, you end up aligning to products. So organizations have to move away from a, from a single model of orientation around projects to think about pro products. That doesn't mean you have projects, you will, because of course certain things affect multiple, GDPR is a great example of what affecting multiple products. You will have a product probably that still lives in that space, but that won't be the normal way you deliver value to customers. That's a, the usual thing that happens to everything at the same time. And of course it's gonna be outcome based, and of course it's gonna be an organization built around those value delivering units. And then the other thing is this work and talent separation. You know, me measurement of work defined by team specific goals, talent managed by master's journeyman, journey person, sorry, not journeyman, and apprentice model. Management concentrates on building and maintaining the environment for agility to, to thrive. So we end up with this very interesting sort of organizational construct to support this change in, in role. But well, hang on a minute, what about me? This is always me at uh, school discos when I was growing up. What about me? Okay, find the role that makes the most sense to you. Now remember that your promotion isn't gonna be tied to the hierarchy you are and how many people you manage and all that stuff. It's gonna be tied to your skills. You can try to the value you deliver, the others that you help. If you're into, if you're really into enabling flow, driving the process, helping others, removing impediments, raising transparency, whew, and you, you know, and you don't, and, and you want to have the title Scrum Master, then maybe a Scrum Master type role is for you. If you care passionately about the customer and about the outcome and about the product and the market, then product owners for you. If you want to master something, whether it's business analysis, testing, or you know, the, the skills that you have as a project manager around managing 
you know, the, 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 the relationships with people and stuff like that, then maybe that's a technical role. And then, you know, if you want to glue it all together, that's a leadership role. If you care about putting an environment in place to make these teams successful, then that is a leadership role. I'm hoping that you all can see your, maybe your position already in this, is in this brand new world. It's not that new and it's not that different, but I think the, you know, the focus, the change that we're seeing is this sort of like moving away from hierarchy and moving to a flatter structure where people care maniacally about customers and there's an environment to, to serve them. I think the world that we're moving to. So, I just wanted to have enough time for questions, so I just want to summarize. Hopefully, you've got a little bit of something out of this, this presentation. Um, working in a complex environment requires an empirical process, self-organization, and focus improvement. We all get that. That's ultimately what Scrum is. Scrum provides a framework around Job titles and specializations do not naturally connect to this, but the skills that you have to do those jobs do. The problem with job titles and specialization of labor is it doesn't allow self-organization. It doesn't, it doesn't allow the flexibility that agility requires. But there are three, in brackets, four roles that we see that are particular collection of those skills that, that, that do need to be separated in, in some way. The, the scrum master, the team member, the product person, and then the leadership, the gluing it all together. But ultimately, everybody has to understand the customer. And, and we also have to decouple work management from people management because transparency is so crucial to delivering empiricism and delivering agility and responding to the environment and being agile. I believe, and what we see over and over again, is the community and helping others get better is fundamental as a sort of career path. We need to start fostering that. But if you look in your own organization outside of your team, how many people have you helped? Now, I've been very fortunate. I've been mentored by some of the great. I've been mentored by Eva Jacobson, the guy in the use case. I've been, I've been uh, mentored by, um, by Ken Schwaber, the creator of Scrum. I've managed to get some mentorship outside of my organization to help me get better at what I'm doing. But Ultimately, we need to build those communities in our organization to allow us to develop others. Now, if you're a leader in that organization, then you need to be helping others get better. Uh, it's not about you. It's not about individualism. Um, focus on learning rather than job title. You know, building those skills, developing those skills and helping others develop those skills is at the heart. Now, now the bottom line. Because, let's be honest, I've painted a pretty aggressive kind of like future state, right? A pretty, like, this is, oh, my God, it's completely different. Reality is many organizations in transition. But by focusing on building skills and getting close to the customer, you are becoming more valuable. Management is traditioning, focusing, moving from systems orientation to more of a people-centric value orientation. Um, but systems are going through a change from serving them to serving you. So the systems of support, so the organizational constructs are changing, HR, incentives, uh, things like that. And Agile is kind of new to HR, but HR and the people that you work in inside your HR organization is a key to the change. Remember that we're moving from, an, uh, from a plan-centric, resource management, top-down oriented organizational construct to an empirical process of self-organization continuous improvement model. So that's what I wanted to share today. This is me and my Mark son, as you can tell, Leicester City supporters. Um, go Foxes, uh, and we're just on the way to soccer in the morning. Um, these are my contact details. Feel free to reach out to me. And uh, I think we've got like five, six minutes for some questions. I think that my colleague Eric is going to help facilitate facilitate that. Um, Mr. Nayberg, have you got any questions coming up? We do, Dave. So uh, great presentation. Thank you very much. And uh, we, we've definitely got some good questions that have come in. We'll get to the ones we can and the ones we can't. Um, we, we certainly feel free to reach out and, and hopefully we'll answer as well. 
Uh, one, talking about work management, people management, and, and the decoupling, and, and I know we have some examples of this. Uh, where have you seen or, or do you see it making sense to bonus or uh, compensate teams as a whole rather than as individuals? Wow. So I, uh, so, oh gosh. So how do I get paid, mate? Yeah, I, I, I hear you over and over again. Should we bonus people should, uh, as teams? Should we bonus them as individuals? So we've seen organizations do both. But, uh, but I actually think, okay, so this is, this is a personal perspective on this. I actually think that um, there needs to be a significant team component to any incentive that you have. We need to incentivize, particularly as we're going through a transition, we need to incentivize people to support the team, to be oriented around delivering team goals, hopefully share those goals. There needs to be a component to any bonus that you deliver to, to focus on that. Now, if you want to be a good citizen as well, there needs to be, and as again, as we go through transitioning, there needs to be an incentive to help people in, help others. So there needs to be some element around that. Now, whether that's in a, a bonus, whether that's, um, you know, Dan Pink talks a lot about um, uh, surprising things, like surprising contributions, surprising bonuses, and spot, like uh, prizes, I think he calls them, those sort of things, whether it's just by, you know, sharing and sharing the people that are contributing most, and that's how open source obviously works. I don't know. But ultimately, I think that the majority of the bonus should always be incentivized as a team. Now, how it's allocated, obviously, Management 3.0 talks a lot about that. You know, there's, you put 100 points on the board, and there's a team of 10 people, and you allocate based on that. You don't need to say exactly how much people are getting, but you could just allocate the percentages um, based on, um, you know. So you have to be very careful in a lot of situations as well when money becomes, because it's definitely a hygiene factor. It won't necessarily motivate, but it will demotivate and get in the way. So I think the bottom line is, yes, I think bonuses should, majority of your bonus should be team based. I also think we should incentivize and encourage people to help others. However, we do that, maybe not necessarily in the traditional bonus model, maybe in some other model. But yes, if you incentivize individuals, then you're going to get that behavior. And we know that the only way we can deliver really value in complex world, a complex situation, is by self-organization and allowing teams to decide how they organize. And if you encourage individuals to stay as individuals, you will not get that teaming, you will not get transparency, you will not get that collaboration, and you will not get that value. Sorry, so, so um, another one. That was a bit of a long answer, but I think we're good here. Sorry. Um, we, we've got, Sorry. Um, we've probably got about a minute or two left, so let's see if we can at least get another question or two in. Uh, I think this is one that's near and dear to your heart. Should the customer or end user be required to be involved throughout the life cycle of the project? or only pulled in at regular intervals after the product piece has been delivered? <laughs> Should the customer be involved frequently? Uh, if they want a good product, I mean, it, it is a choice ultimately. If, if they want a good product, then they need to be involved very frequently. The team needs to work very closely with the customer. And uh, the, the, the product owner ultimately is making decisions about what's in the best interest of that customer in terms of value. Uh, the, the customer needs to be involved frequently. Yes, they cannot just be involved at the end. I'll try to keep that short, Eric. Sorry. Awesome. Thank you. So uh, another one, uh, someone who met, actually met and spent some time with Jeff Sutherland. I uh, spoke with Jeff Sutherland and uh, asked him about the BA role and where they fit. He said there, there is a need for BAs, and they come under the team, the development, the dev team umbrella. Um, but he, he, he didn't know where other roles might fit, like UI developer, service developer, BAs, et cetera. Are they all under the role of developer? So, yeah, I, I, so I'd agree with, with, with Jeff, yes. Um, yes, yes, and yes. They need to be – they're delivering value to customers. They need to be in a team that's delivering value. Now, you're going to say, well, what happens if you've only got one UX person and they're supporting multiple? teams, then their job is to help others deliver UX into those teams. They become a shared service 
that, that, that they are very basically responsible for helping those others develop those skills and to deliver that value. Maybe it's through, in the case of UX, facilitating customer empathy mapping with the team. They teach that to the team. The team can do it themselves. You know, I think obviously there's no right, wrong. This is the reason why Agile and Scrum is so damn hard because there isn't one cookie 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 actor model that fits everything because the problems in the context that you're working in are so, so different. So what's interesting is you need to have a model that facilitates all of that. So that's the reason why that role, right, the team member. Now, you need to have all the skills to deliver that to you. If that means you need a full-time security guy, a full-time uh, UX person, that's okay. Now, if you haven't got those, then the team has to be smart how it works with those shared people uh, and uh, that can be incredibly challenging cool so I, I think we're uh, pretty much at time um you want to just uh close it out there cool. okay well, well thank you. i want to thank oh sorry I'll go ahead yeah sorry <laughs> dave go ahead i'm sorry no, no, I was just going to say thank you for your time, everybody, and uh, and I just put up the PDU credit slide up, sorry, and now I'm handing over to you. Yeah. Sorry about that. Okay, well, on behalf of all of us here at Project Times and VA Times, I'd like to thank you so much for being with us today. That was a fantastic session. I'm sure everyone would agree. And I'd uh, also like to thank Eric for facilitating the, the Q&A. Thank you both so much. Um, I'd also like to thank everybody out there for joining us. And just as a reminder, look out for the email letting you know when the on-demand version of this webinar will be posted with the links to the presentation slides as well as your personalized certificate. So once again, on behalf of the entire team here at Project Times, the Business Analyst Times, we'd like to thank you so much for being here and we look forward to seeing you next month. Thanks so much. <laughs>